All right, we're going to go ahead and start. Donna is on her um, way. Um, this is the September 13th Bicycle Pedestrian Subcommittee meeting of the Transportation and Parking Commission. Um, we've got a full agenda. I have a hard stop at 9.55, so we're going to be done at, then, uh, at that point, <laughs> however far we get. Um, the first item, okay, Donna is here, is... Um, to take public comment on items other than what are is currently on the agenda. So I don't know if there's anybody um, who is in, in first I'll take any public comments here that are based on items not on the agenda. I don't see any hands. Um, oh, go ahead. So questions. Um, kind of a follow up from my comments from the last time I was here is to express some concern that there was um, uh, going to be a lot of pushback about the Main Street redesign. And uh, I was really hoping to see the city formulate some kind of uh, response, frequently asked questions, uh, you know, something to help um, provide easy access to information that would help reduce the amount of sort of misinformation that seems to be floating around out there. Um, my concern is that the um, uh, Main Street, picture Main Street um, report that uh, is up right now is um, just kind of expansive and, and hard to navigate. Uh, I mean, I, I find it challenging and I'm in favor of the project and um, want to learn more. And so it, something that's a lot more user friendly, um, I think would go a long way to helping um, and answer these questions. And uh, I mean, we've seen, I don't even know how many 50 letters to the editor at this point uh, uh, against the um, Main Street redesign. So clearly there's a need for a response. And so I was hoping to find out what has happened in the meantime over the past two months to sort of formulate that response. Thanks. Yep. Thanks. Um, just so you know, there, um, I don't know if you're you think the picture the story map is unclear how to navigate yes. or yeah. okay it's that's that's meant to be sort of easy but the mayor's office is come is finalizing a, an FAQ yeah. to um again respond to all the questions that had previously been answered both in the yeah. public hearing as well as years three years ago when they first right. came I, up so it's a you know, sort of pulling all those um, pieces of information that have been, um, that um, have already been answered and then re-answering them in this format. But, uh, you know, I will, just, just so you know, we can't have a discussion about it because it's not on the agenda, but um, it, but I appreciate your comments okay. about that. <laughs> okay. Um, any other, okay, I see two hands raised, Julia Reisman. Yeah, I'm just would like to uh, speak in support of the redesign of Main Street and uh, know that even though there's a petition out there to raise questions about it, there's a lot of public support that is quiet in support of creating a safe space, uh, safe streets and reduced accidents and, and access for bicycles. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. Um, Elena, I see your hand. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, just to echo the two comments that have already been said, um, I know there's, in just to have it for the public record, I know there's been a lot of pushback on Main Street redesign um, and just voicing support um, for both you, Carolyn, the planning department and the mayor's office. Um, it's been a really robust public process um, that I've been engaged with um, since 2020. And the story map shows it's been going on for years before that. Um, I went down to the Taste of Main Street this week, or Taste of Northampton this weekend. Um, we printed up some flyers with a QR code to the Picture Main Street um, website, um, and I had some really great conversations with folks down there. A lot of people just hadn't heard about the redesign. A lot of other people had heard about it and were in support of it, so just trying to debunk a lot of the misinformation that we're seeing online um, and through the petition. Um, and just once again, voice my support for the Main Street redesign. Great. Thanks, Elena. 
Um, I don't see any other hands, so I'll turn it over to Donna um, if you want to go to the next agenda item, which is sort of a recap of where we are. Whoops, she didn't mean to do that. Um, for the, uh, sorry, I screwed this up. Speaker gallery, okay. Is Donna still with us? Yeah, I'm here. Good morning. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Morning. All right, so we're looking for some updates on various projects here. So I can just kind of run through um, what I have on my list um, and kind of just talk us through various things. Um, so uh, first of all, let's talk about um, Carolyn. I don't have the agenda up. Is this the this is the bike lanes, right? Um, yes, the uh, okay. temporary installations. Um, I, yeah. Yep. Okay. So um, we did um, uh, uh, two temporary installations, one by the uh, Northampton High School and one on New South Street um, to just kind of see how uh, bicyclists liked it um, and to just see what sort of comments we got um, from, uh, you know, passersby. Um, so the one by the high school is still in place. And um, I think I've gotten a lot of positive feedback about that and people um, really like that it's both prohibiting parking and kind of making a continuous lane for bicyclists through that corridor. The one on New South Street had sort of mixed reviews. Um, I got as many people who were annoyed by it as who liked it. Um, unfortunately, Mass DOT really didn't like it. Um, and they did not like it because of its proximity to the bridge. So the bridge, um, MassDOT has uh, jurisdiction over all of the bridges in the city, even if the city uh, pays for them. MassDOT is the inspector of the bridges, and they are mm -hmm. sort of the ranking people who make decisions about bridges. So in order for us to put the blocks um, out in an effective way to protect that crosswalk and to kind of keep traffic in the traffic lane, which is what we were trying to do, we actually had to have an installation on top of the bridge. So I was contacted by the folks at District 2 and the bridge unit in Boston, and they said to me, get that stuff off the bridge like two days ago. Um, so that's why that installation was removed. There are um, specific weight limits that they have. There's, you know, live load and dead load. There's, um, you know, 20 to 30 feet of the approaches to the bridge that they don't want anything on. Um, so, you know, it's something we thought about when we put the installation out. It's a couple thousand pounds. You know, in our opinion, it wasn't a big deal and it did more good than harm. Um, Mass DOT didn't agree, but there was an abrupt removal of that installation. And that is the reason why there is an abrupt removal. Um, so I, I'll actually, um, Carolyn, correct me if I'm wrong. The installation, I think, um, showed us that this was actually a very effective mechanism for kind of keeping cars where we wanted them to be and putting bicyclists where we wanted them to be in a safe way. Um, and we've asked Tool to take a look at that area and it's going to be added into the Main Street project. Um, so there will be improvements made there and it was part of that process. So correct me if I'm wrong on that, but that was the um, ultimate outcome of that installation. So sorry for the kind of abrupt, like we're pulling out of here. Um, but, you know, I have to abide by what Mass DOT tells me to do. So that's um, the update on that. Thanks, Donna. Um, Nick, and then <laughs> James. Uh, hedge, uh, hedge. So um, does that sound workable, Carolyn, to kind of include that with tool in that design? Because that it does seem like this is, again, uh, Donna, thank you very much both for the pilot and the, the update on it, um, that it was it, it did seem to be effectively serving its purpose there, yeah. which I think it also has been true up by the high school. So is it feasible then to kind of incorporate that into the... Yeah, we have a design. quote from Tool to add it to the contract. So um, they thought that it was appropriate um, for that reason um, as well, that it just it didn't, because they would have to figure out how to feather back yeah. the um, on-lane 
um, separated um, bike facility anyway. So it works well, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Donna, thank you. And again, thanks for the pilot and for the report. And uh, too bad about uh, MassDOT's objection. But am I right that their objection was strictly about the weight limit on the bridge and not the concept of a protected bike lane so that we we can ask tool and the city independently can certainly pursue other ways of separated bike lanes that that include going over bridges like that, for example, uh, flexible bollards, which are used in many cities around the country. It, yep, that's absolutely correct. That this was a, strictly a weight problem. Um, I, I mean, we actually toyed with the idea of flexible bollards, and I would not be averse to that. The, the problem I have with flexible bollards is that I have to have a way to de-ice that bike lane. So, you know, this is kind of the struggle with a hard physical separation of bike lanes is I have no way to de-ice it. So they work great you know, April through October, but once we start to get frozen precipitation, I do not have the ability to get in there um, and actually get a plow blade down to clear the gutter. So this is kind of what the struggle is. Like I can put these installations in, I can use blocks, I can use bollards, I can use cones, like whatever, um, but I can't have them in 12 months out of the year. That is the struggle. Unless we agree, okay, I'm going to install this, and it's just not going to be the ice. But that seems to me to be sort of a dangerous scenario. Um, you know, if we install something like this and, and then you can't yes, treat it, so um, <laughs> so that's really our challenge. Donna, can I? Do you know? Um, I thought they had those um, flexible bollards that sort of snap in for a better term for a lack of better term into the ground so that they are removable for let's say the winter season have you seen anything like that i feel um, like they I did have, that on route two I, yeah i have heard of them um that that would be like kind of a sub sub surface you know like the, it would have to be like installed below grade and then you snap it in or something um, so, I mean, that's certainly something we can look into. It's not something I have or a roadway treatment we've done. The, yeah. the one place we have the plastic delineators is the intersection of Federal, uh, South Main, Nonotoc, and those are above grade, um, yeah. you know, because like there's not traffic going over them. So right. we could certainly look into like a below grade, you know, we're going to take them out and November and put them back in in April or something, and, and that's a good solution. Okay. Um, do you um, um, do you want to talk about the other two installations? Um, or those are is that basically they're just they're still in, so um, we're waiting. It, yeah. So so by the high school, we're still in. I mean, I'm gonna have to pull that out of there. I mean, it's September. I'm you know I'm gonna have to see what the weather looks like, but I'm probably gonna have to pull that out of there by Thanksgiving, I would say, because you know exactly like we talked about. Um, we're not going to be able to de-ice that. So I'm going to have to get that pulled out of there. You know, I will leave it as long as I possibly can, um, but we are going to have to remove it just for safety reasons. Um, Craft Avenue is on this list. So that's something that um, Carolyn and I had talked about kind of, um, you know, putting bump outs at the bottom of Craft Avenue. We have some issues with PDTA making turning movements down there. And we also have um, the arrows on the ground that are kind of pointing people left or pointing people right. Um, we ended up not doing an installation this year because we, we were a little bit concerned about PDTA's ability to move their buses through that corridor. And we were also a little concerned about creating confusion for people um, who would be a little bit fuzzy about, okay, this arrow is telling me I can only go left or I can only go right. Um, and you know you don't want to create a, an unsafe scenario for motorists, so that's something we just kind of put on hold for right now, and and we'll be revisiting in the future. Great. Thanks. Um, any other questions from the committee before I take um, raise hands from um, others? Brett. Brett. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to say that I've. Uh, heard this impediment before, this um, not having the ability to de-ice, to 
keep things safe in the winter. And I feel like this is an issue that I don't want to keep hearing. Um, I'm not blaming anybody. I'm saying I think we need to work together to figure out what money and tools need to be allocated to the DPW to do that work in the winter. Uh, we have a lot of paths in the city. We have sidewalks. We have um, we, we want more lanes and narrow lanes and protected lanes and things like that. And we, you know, we've, we've heard a lot of calls for that. I feel like it's time that we start to build up our, our tools to be able to have this infrastructure. And I, I get that that's probably expensive, but um, I feel like it's a long-term investment that would be worthwhile. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, Ben. Um, so just real quick, I worked for a number of years at Look Park on the maintenance crew and was there for like seven years and every winter season, we would switch off the mowing decks from the Toro uh, ride-on mowers that we had and switch on either like a power broom in front of the mower or a snowblower on the front of the mower. Very simple operation. There was cabs that went on those mowers that were heated. So you could very easily, I mean, we would use them to clear the sidewalks, to get in tight places. Um, I imagine that the um, parks uh, department here in Northampton uses very similar mowers and it was that was the solution. You could switch over the uh, upper, you know, which had on the front and um, in sidewalks, I think they even had an ice spreader or rather a, a, a salt spreader. Uh, for the uh, board as well. And that's how we took care of all the paths at Look Park. Great. Thanks. Um, I think I saw Ben. Did you have your hand Yeah, so <laughs> hi, hi, guys. So first of all, Donna, this is great information. So like, it's really useful that you tested these things out, that you've kind of highlighted the problems going forward. Because as Brett said, we're we're hoping to have more of these lands and so planning now to try to acquire the appropriate equipment to get the appropriate budget for you to think about multi-use equipment as you look at uh, exactly like the situation in look park but as we look at kind of what are some of the other types of equipment this is the type of planning that ought to happen now so that as we add lanes we don't use that as a reason to not create protected lanes. So I, I realize I'm just echoing what everyone else said, but I, I think it's great insight. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Um, Elena, did you have your hand raised or did I, was that from last time? No, I had it up, but I was just going to echo everything that Brett and Ben have already said about procuring okay. equipment. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> all right. So um, Donna, we also talked about the sort of moving on to the next item, some other issues on um, streets, so um, Prospect as well as Locust Street. So I don't know if you want to tackle those one at a time. I, yeah, I can. And I also just want to briefly um, talk about the high school design and where we are right. with that, too. Yep. So three projects. Um, so the high school design, um, we've had uh, Fuss and O'Neill working on this for several months. Um, they recently completed survey of the area, so they have to like shoot grades and get extensive the right away. Um, one of the things that I've been talking to them about is kind of what treatments we're going to be looking at in the intersections of um, Woodlawn and Route 9 and Elm Street and Route 9. Um, and are we considering cabling that intersection? That's something that we've been talking about. Um, one of the things that concerns me about this corridor is the utilities. So if we're going to come in and do surface treatments, install signals, look at potentially, you know, either raised crosswalks or a cable of the entire intersection or some sort of road diet where we're actually shrinking the traveled way, which I think is warranted. Um, I have to think about the utilities that are running underneath the roadway. So um, we have problems in all three utilities here. So we have a more than 100 year old water main, we have a more than 100 year old storm main, um, and we have insufficient stormwater infrastructure. So that's 
Um, it's a little bit of a wrinkle, um, not uh, atypical for something like this. So I've had to engage their utilities division to take a closer look at these utilities. Um, I'm having a little back and forth with them about kind of, you know, you don't necessarily want to take this project and blow it up into something enormous, but it's it's going to turn into something a little bit bigger. Um, we cannot come in and build something on top of a 100-year-old water main. Um, the water main is going to break and it's going to destroy whatever we build on top of it. Um, so before we do anything else, um, I have to fully assess these utilities um, and then come up with a plan to address those. A lot of times the way we do projects like this is we have to come in and we have to deal with the utility work first. Um, that would be the first phase. And then we do the roadway treatment on top of it once that first phase is done. So this is um, slowing us down in a way that, um, you know, I'm not thrilled about. Um, but it would not be responsible to not um, go through this process. So we're um, just in a, a little bit of, we've taken a little bit of a detour off of like a full speed ahead, like let's get this signal in, you know, ASAP um, to, to audit the utilities. So that's where we're at with the high school. Um, the next two things I want to talk about are Locust Street. So the Route 9 corridor from Cooley Jacobson up through Florence Center, um, we have received a lot of complaints um, just about, you know, the road is wide there, obviously overly wide, um, you know, high speed. And then once you start heading down into Florence Center, you've got folks trying to get in and out of Star Avenue and all of the other side streets who have visibility issues, trying to move in and out of Cooper's um, and, and other businesses. So, you know, we've taken a little bit of a piecemeal approach to this in the past. You know, people will send us like a parking request and we'll say, okay, well, maybe we should get rid of this parking space. Maybe we should get rid of that parking space. Um, you know, and I think that that's, um, Fine. If you have a bright and burning safety issue, I think the entire corridor is is a safety issue. So, um, what I have asked Fuss and O'Neill to do, you know, and again, you could really be looking at like a tip corridor project here that starts at the high school and runs all the way through Florence. Um, but I don't think any of us want to wait, you know, 15 years for for an improvement. So. What I have asked Fox and O'Neill to do is to take a look at that corridor starting at the Cooley Dickinson Light and going up through Florence, making some very targeted recommendations for what we can do to um, kind of re-strike that area and shrink everything down to a more reasonable lane width, and then make some recommendations for us at uh, conflict points like side streets, uh, crosswalks, um, and see what tools they may be able to recommend to just kind of slow people down and call vehicle pedestrian and bicyclist attention to conflict points as we start to move into Florence Center. So that's the first piece of this. Um, and so it, the way this works when I engage an engineering firm is we sort of talk about, okay, this is what I want you to do. And then they have to write a proposal for like how much this is going to cost. Um, I have uh, traffic calming funding that comes, you know, via the, the city council each year. Um, I get $50,000. Um, just to give you an idea of how quickly that money moves, you know, each intersection that we study like if I went to just an intersection and said, I'd like to study this intersection, does it need a stop sign? You know, I'm looking at like five or $6,000 per intersection. So the money goes very quickly. So just because I asked them for a proposal doesn't necessarily mean I have enough money to pay for them to study this. Um, and they study it and they'll make some recommendations and then we actually have to design it and build it. So that's just a little bit of a financial piece of it. Um, so that's Locust Street. So I'm waiting for a proposal from Boston O'Neill on that. Um, and then Prospect Street. So at the PPP meeting on Tuesday, kind of a sneak peek of what we're going to be talking about. We've received several complaints from people um, all up and down Prospect Street from side streets kind of starting in like the Warfield area, going up like Stoddard Street, Winter Street, 
Um, the folks trying to get out of those side streets and they just can't get on the prospect because you've got, you know, a parking lane and you've got a bike lane and they have to kind of nose all the way out into the prospect street. And, you know, so much like the Route 9 corridor, instead of taking these seats now, I think the time has come to have kind of a larger conversation about the entire Prospect Street corridor. You know, yes, we can whack away at parking close to the side streets, but do we want to have a larger conversation about what we might be able to do in this entire corridor? For example, if we wipe out parking, on all of Prospect Street, we can actually look at restriping that entire area, creating better bike facilities, um, and actually shifting to maybe a protected bike lane, but you're going to lose your on street parking. So what I, we're going to do is we're going to put um, this matter on the agenda just for discussion. And Councilman Moulton has done a lot of outreach to folks in the neighborhood um, you know, we just want to kind of hear everyone's experiences and everybody's thoughts on, you know, what are your, you know, are you using parking on Prospect Street? What would happen if you lost it? You know, what do you think about building this up for, for protective bike lanes? Um, so based on kind of what we hear at the CPC meeting will sort of push us in one direction or another. Um, and we may end up just going back to, okay, we're going to whack away at various parking spaces or, you know, maybe it's time to blow up this entire corridor. So those are my updates. Nick. Donna, thank you very much for both those updates. I think you've hit two important projects that require more information and study. It's very helpful to get a sense that that's on the kind of preliminary conversation with the TPC. Um, and again, I think that kind of particularly for the Route 9 project, kind of clarifying and getting a better information for that is, is going to be a really helpful step. So thank you. Any other comments from committee members? James. Yeah, uh, Donna, thanks uh, for me too. Um, I just uh, wanted to say that Prospect Street used to be worse. And it used to there used to be no uh, striping. And uh, about ten years ago, when we implemented uh, complete streets in Northampton, uh, uh, DPW did I thought a pretty good job of significant improvements all along that that corridor, Prospect Street. And um, uh, just to put that on the record and to say yes, it's never done. And I am I am a close neighbor to Prospect Street. I'm there all the time. And Sometimes I have trouble uh, crossing safely in a crosswalk because traffic does, doesn't yield. So there's definitely a culture there of got to get through, you know, in my rush hour and uh, devil may care. So happy to see a uh, uh, meta conversation about how to change that that culture of speeding cars there. Yeah, I think it also there some there's some key intersections that. I think have come up in the um, requests for traffic calming as well. So what from down the hill from where Round Hill and Summer sort of come in and intersect. Yep. And also the, I think the Finn Street intersection is quite confusing um, for some folks about there's some, and pedestrians. So pedestrians are there, cars feel have the right of way um, even, and take that right of way, even if there's a pedestrian in that crosswalk. So I think that will be good to look at as well and sort of how how that intersection or turn is controlled. Um, so thanks, Donna. Any other comments from the committee? Any public comments? Okay. Yeah, Karen. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I... Uh, thanks, Donna. This is really, I appreciate these conversations and these, we, we're sharing a lot of information. We really appreciate it. It helps us to think about things. Um, if I had to pick one of those corridors to spend more money on than another, I would pick the Route 9 corridor because, as James says, our work is never done. It can always be better in all of the locations, but I feel like there's much more to be done on the Route 9 corridor and because there's higher speeds involved. Um, and I feel like some of the changes would be simpler. I feel like 
we've picked up a lot of the low hanging fruit on the prospect street stuff. That's going to be hard. I don't, I don't, not saying don't do it, but if I had to pick one, I would pick the route nine, um, because of the higher speeds. And I think there's a lot more we can do there. That's all. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Brett. Caroline, is it okay if I make a comment? This is Lily. Sure, go ahead, Lily. Thanks, um, and good morning, everyone. I um, unfortunately had to come in late to the meeting, so I missed um, Donna's update about the temporary separated bike lanes, and um, especially related to New South Street, where I, you know, the a corridor that I use every day, coming off of my home on Monroe Street. Um, but it, your your um, discussion about Prospect Street, Donna, resonated with me because there is a lot, you know, uh, Route 10 is very wide and has a lot of, in my perception, underutilized parking pretty much along the whole thing. And um, although it does have a, a bike lane, there are still really high speeds. And there's just um, a, a presence of asphalt that is probably not used because again very little parking on especially the outer part of route 10 so just wanted to throw that in there as a uh um you know as a consideration i i do like the model of of, of tracking or um querying I, I i like less querying the public about their use of parking than actually tracking the use of parking itself getting really hard data um and because people are always going to fight over giving up a parking spot. But when you can demonstrate that the parking is actually not used, then that's that's um, empirical. Um, so anyway, that that's a different that might be the approach you want to take in Prospect Street, too, which is just track it. Um, and I don't know how you go about that, but um, that would be my recommendations. Um, and I'm, I'm maybe at the end, someone That's can bring me up to date on what happened to the um, temporary um, protected bike lane on New South Street, but I won't hold up the meeting for that. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Lily. Um, okay, if I don't see any other comments on that. Um, thank you, Donna, for those updates. Um, next on the agenda is... Um, a proposal from Friends of Northampton Trails. Um, this circles back to a conversation we had, um, I don't know, earlier in the year um, about um, the addition and the increasing use of e-transportation um, um, tools <laughs> on the bike path and concern about speeds. So, um, Freeman couldn't be here, but George Kohout is here to talk about the um, proposal that FNT has um, to help facilitate um, information about using um, e-assist and e-bikes on the bike path. So Good. take it away, George. Good morning, everybody. Hi, I'm George Kohout. Yeah, usually Freeman represents the, uh, the FNT perspective on the Bike and Ped Committee. Um, but right, we've heard as an organization from a lot of the users of the trail network about the, the, the growth, the surge in e-bikes along the trail. Um, and it is just one of kind of more activity on the trail, fast bikes, um, whether they're irregular and how it's, uh, how it can be dangerous for pedestrians, um, who also use the trail. Um, so what we have proposed is rather than fix signage like at the trail hedge or the trail intersections is um, just launch signs that make a couple of two or three pertinent points. Um, and, I, and I'm not sure what those are, but we had a similar initiative about three years ago when the pandemic first happened and the use of the trail surged um, by pedestrians and bicyclists. And uh, behavior got, let's say, a little bit more rowdy. Um, and there was a, certainly then there was all these concerns about distancing and whatnot. So we put up a series of three signs, one that said, announce when you're passing on, on the left, um, please um, leash your dogs and keep social distancing. And what we did is we moved those series of signs. There was three sets. 
we moved them around the trail every two weeks so that it would catch different users kind of attention. And we also, the signage was very, a lot of white space, big text, just so as you were going by, you would see the, the signage. We don't have, as Lily said, any empirical data uh, to say whether that affected behavior, but at least we think it made some a kind of a, a unconscious notion to users that somebody is kind of being um, mindful of what's going on on the trail. Um, we can't ask the police to enforce speed limits on the trail. There is a speed limit on the trail network, which I believe is 12 miles an hour, um, but that's really difficult to enforce. For, um, for e-assist and e-bikes, it's 12 miles an hour. Okay. Yeah. There's nothing in the ordinance about um, fast pedestrians or regular bikes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I uh, all I, I can double check, but I I'm, the reason why there's this speed limit for e-bikes e is because they're heavier. And so the impacts, of course, yeah. are um, more severe if there's if there are collisions. So um, I thought it applied to all traffic on the rail trail. No, I thought that the, the the obvious rationale was to limit uh, danger from e-bikes, but that it was applied that, that it was it was a blanket, and and that our the promise was uh, from Wayne. Don't worry, we'll never enforce this for bicyclists. But I might be misremembering. Yeah, can you just confirm? Um, I can. Um, I looked at it the other day. It's specifically twelve miles for e-bikes. There may be another speed limit for all other users um that's just under 20 i can double check that but i know i looked at the code for the um electric bikes um and that was you know as we discussed based on the weight and i will say we brought this um we had this conversation like i said a few uh, months ago i don't know if it was here or at tpc but um we talked a lot about how you know static signs certainly are not effective there we can't do enforcement um it's um and and i did have a conversation with um the police chief she's supportive of something like this more of an informational sign that says hey if you're on an e-bike this is the speed limit and and having them if fnt is willing to um sort of manage those signs and move them around that would certainly um uh, likely be more effective than just static signs at particular locations. But at any rate, the chief was, you know, supportive of that concept. So just wanted to let you all know about that. So yeah, just to finish up, I think one of the signs mm -hmm. also might have a QR code that brings you directly to the city ordinance. So if you needed to see it in writing about the speed limit. Um, so that would be something FNT's um, happy to take care of the printing and the cost of that. I don't know the process, whether we still have to go to the transportation and parking. I know the DPW manages what goes on the trail. Um, so we'll work with them to make sure we're not impeding any traffic. Um, they would more than likely come down during the winter. Um, but uh, that's what we'd like to do just to try to get a handle on this. And again, just, just to give out information to people that may not be familiar with what the accepted behaviors are. Uh, as a user. Again, I want to really quickly, because I know we have other things on the agenda as well. Thank you, George, for this. I thought it went really well during the pandemic, that additional information. And I've always appreciated how that's been done in cons consultation with the city, because I think that is a good model of having this kind of complementary efforts. And I think right now we might want to revisit this in a future meeting. But again, I'm appreciative. And I think this is a really helpful strategy of the movable sign, which don't have the static sign issues. So um, any other committee members have comments before we move to public comments? Okay, um, go ahead, Ben. So is there, like, there's different categories of e-bikes, and there's pedal assist ones, and then there's just throttle ones. Mm -hmm. Is there already rules on the book about the throttle ones, and what are those rules? Basically, it is that any um, electric bike has to have a pedal assist function to it. Mm -hmm. It just can't be throttle control. So you can have, I, I, you know, and again, I'm not a savant around all the different e-bikes that are out there, but it needs to be, you need to be able to pedal the bike. 
in order to be, be used. But is that like in order for it to move, or can you have that be as an option? Like, could you just throttle around all day, but still just have some pedals? I, again, I don't know how bikes are made, Ben. Um, yeah. I think under a certain, I thought under a certain um, miles per hour, they had to be pedaled. Um, and yeah. then you could engage the throttle, but I'll, we'll have to, I'll have to do more. Looking. I know like Acadia Park has e-bikes, but there's a, there's a, they have to be pedal assist and, and you can't just be in there right there. But it exists. Go ahead, James. Yeah, briefly. One main problem is that, uh, despite the best intentions of the city and, um, uh, and advocates, most of those, uh, most e-bikes can be reconfigured. Uh, easily by users with a simple clip of a wire that that um, stops them from having, for example, the speed limit cap or the need to pedal. Mm -hmm. So yeah. unfortunately, yeah. Um, those products are are made to be easily right. reconfigured. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I I think first of all I I can answer what 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 the law is, and as James points out, not everyone cares what the law is, um, but uh, there's class two. And class one e-bikes, class one e-bikes are ones that only work when you pedal and you get an automatic assist from a battery. And then there's class two bikes where you can pedal and operate a, thr a throttle and they're independent and they're supposed to have a maximum speed of 20 miles an hour. But as James said, you, you can defeat that. Massachusetts has not yet adopted the class three designation, which is one that's uh, faster than that and fully uh, throttle operated. Uh, I would call that a motorcycle. Um, I I will say as a user, a, like a daily user of uh, of this, this trail, I would like, first of all, thank you, George and great model. And what I would like to add is obviously social distancing is not a necessary sign, but a sign that would be helpful would be uh, something to, to the effect of stay in your lane. People treat this as a very wide one-way path. And I can't tell you the number of times when I have had to choose to ride my narrow tired bike way off the path to avoid hitting people and not just pedestrians, although largely pedestrians, um, but also cyclists who are traveling three, four abreast and kind of dare you to just like run into them. I, I don't, so it would be nice to create some sort of reminder that that there are rules on this road just like there are on other roads. Thanks, Ben. Um, just to, I did look up the code that um, the 12 mile per hour is for e-assist and e-bikes. So there's not a distinction between, um, and the intention is that it's low speed electric, but it's not, there's not a prohibition in Northampton for those full throttle bikes. It's just there's a 12 mile per hour. Yeah. So. Um, so should we um, formally I take was, a vote? Oh, sorry. Carolyn, hi. I was hoping to quickly jump in. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so um, thanks so much, George, for bringing us uh, to the bike ped meeting. I think it's a great idea to have some sort of signage on the trail um, to the extent of just being a good neighbor or a good, um, you know, being courteous on the trail. Um, I ride my bike. I also own an e-bike. Um, I have hesitation around putting a speed limit sign per se, um, but something along the lines of saying like slow down when I'm passing or you know, a reminder, you know, maybe any sort of reminder like that for a couple of reasons. One, we all know that speed limits um, don't actually change behavior on the trail, posting speed limit signs. Um, we see that with drivers all the time. Um, and then the second point is my e-bike personally, and I know a lot of others don't actually have speedometers. So I have no idea how fast I'm going. Um, so I could be going, I know it goes up to 20 uh, miles per hour, but I could be going fast faster or slower, depending on, um, you know, the terrain, the grade of the, the trail. Um, so, you know, I, I just don't know how fast I'm going. Um, that being said, I am super cautious when I am passing other cyclists or pedestrians. Um, I slow down quite a bit, but I think having that reminder for folks um, would be really helpful. Um, I just have hesitation about actually posting any sort of speed limit sign on the trail. Thanks, Melinda. 
Um, so if there are no other comments, I mean, I think um, they this, um, I don't, I think we could have a vote to support this. I mean, it sounds like people are generally in support, but maybe if we could formalize that with a vote. So if there's someone who'd like to move that, that would be good. Uh, so just, just briefly, can I ask a clarifying question um, about what, we're, what we will be voting on? Um, signs I get uh, with some helpful things is, is what I'm getting. There, there, we don't, we don't have any specific language yet or specific points that we're making yet on the signs. Is that right? Yes. So, so I would okay. move. Thank you. I, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, support the proposal of the Friends of Northampton Trails to develop a set of movable signs uh, that would be uh, the wording of which would be put together in consultation um, with the, um, you know, with this office. Um, that would provide information and, and encouragements to slow down and other aspects of, of trail, rail trail etiquette. Is there a second? Second. James. I'll second that. Okay. And then I'll just do a roll call since we're hybrid um, and I'll start in the room. Nick? Uh, 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 yes. <laughs> James Lowenthal? Yes. Um, Brett? Constantine. Yes. Um, Donna. She's been here for this. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to call you out. Um, <laughs> and I will vote yes as well. Okay, great. Thank you. That passes unanimously. <laughs> um, and the last item on the agenda, we've got about five minutes left. Um, as you know, Claudia Lefko asked to um, present um, a request for support for a sidewalk construction um, along William Street. Um, so we don't have a bunch of time left. Um, I sent you the, um, the formal request and the statement so I can hand it over to you, Claudia. Go Thanks. Ahead. You know, um, not to be a complainer, but the whole meeting is dedicated to bicycling and seems car traffic when the committee is bike and pedestrian. And I'm here about a sidewalk issue. And I don't think I can actually speak to it in five minutes. As you saw from what I sent out, it's a kind of complicated, very broad, out of the box idea. But just to say, you know, most people walk, most people aren't riding bicycles. That's the most common um, form of transportation. And so this has come up because there was a blind woman in a neighborhood who was having trouble navigating a sidewalk. And the response from the planning department or the city is that we don't respond to complaints about sidewalks. If there's a bike accident, you know, a bike goes up, all this attention goes onto the intersection. I'm here talking about a very problematic sidewalk, but I don't even want to fix that sidewalk. I'm talking about something that's much broader than that. It's something about creating a green space, about involving people who have no access to green space, i.e. the people at the lumber yard. I'm talking about safety for childcare in the neighborhood. And I'm talking about involving a broad range of people and issues, including about health. As we, you know, as I said in the document, there is a lot of concern about people's health. And so the people on Holly Street who are connected to the education collaborative, they're very enthusiastic about this proposal because they see that drawing people into a lovely space where there's better air and possibility for exercise is part of their mandate and stuff. So, but when I've, like I spoke with Sarah Lavalley about this, or I've spoken with Tom Anise about this, various people, and, and I sort of get a blank look that what does this have to do with the city? Like what, what is, there's no saying, oh yeah, well, we have CDBG money. You're in a low income neighborhood. We could use that. Or we have this amount of money. 
So I guess I would like to, if I could come back and be put more at the front of the agenda, I might have more information at that point. For instance, I think we might be applying for some of this money from the, I can't remember what it is, but the organization on Holly Street and just do a more complete presentation, but also urge you, I don't know if anyone on the committee is particularly a walker. Like I know in Cambridge, there was a whole committee that was about pedestrians and how you get the most safe, more safely from one place to another. So I, I'm trying to be an advocate for pedestrians <laughs> and say that, you know, people fall all the time, especially like we're aging, the population, <laughs> our eyes aren't good, but the sidewalks are terrible. And when people fall down and get hurt, you know, they can let the city know, but we're not, I don't think, keeping track of that and paying enough attention to that. So with all due respect, if I could come back another time and, and, and talk with, talk more, that would be great. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so uh, Claudia, I'm personally more of a walker than a biker. And I think much of the conversations we've been having have been crosswalks related, not Route 9 and Prospect Street mm -hmm. are as much crosswalks and walkers there. But again, I share this concern. I'm also appreciative of the work that we've done around the edges in some of these areas and how it still leaves gaps. I'm proud of all the nature areas, the kind of preserved areas we have in that vicinity and the work that was happening with the walking school bus and other kind of efforts to try to improve that because it was terrible. <clears throat> and it's, I think, moving into a better direction. My question really for Carolyn is, where does this fit in terms of other kind of plans and other efforts? Because the city has done a remarkable job of kind of pulling together this grant or this approach or a little bit of, of traffic funds to allow these projects to move forward. As part of complete streets, I think it's very much you know, kind of thinking about this, but I just, I'm, I'm, I, I appreciated the proposal and I thought it was a great project and with some really good ideas. I just wasn't sure how it ran and, and I see we're at 955 and you yeah. said we had a hard job. Claudia, yeah. thank you. I support having a future agenda high yeah. up so we can start. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's fine. I have, and as we've discussed before and with Claudia as well, she knows this is that, you know, we have, there's a policy in place and a strategy to try to address the most you know, prioritize these because we have horrible walks all over. Sure. People are um, have hazards in front of where they live, you know, across the city. So that it's a problem with that's a long list of for solutions. So we certainly also want to look at it holistically so that when we're building sidewalks, it's not just about the sidewalk, but it's the whole piece of the infrastructure together. Like Donna was saying with a high school, we can't improve the intersections without dealing with the water and the sewer and the stormwater. So that's that's part of the complex. Can I, can I just add one thing that the sidewalk that was built onto Holly Street, the, the walking school bus doesn't actually go there. The walking school bus goes all the way down to William Street and proceeds that way. So there was a halfway sidewalk built out. So um, I don't know why, how that happened. But anyway, I think the whole priority system around sidewalks is something this committee could revisit. You know, how do the prior priorities get set and, and is there a need to change them in some way? So I appreciate your having me speak. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Okay.